Susan Chomba, a PhD candidate at University of Copenhagen and a research fellow at the World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi. I'm going to present to you a case of participatory forest management in Garendare Forest, which is in Kenya, uh, exploring the endowments and entitlements nexus. And to the objectives of this study, the first objective was to evaluate the roles of participatory forest management in providing community level benefits and reducing vulnerability. And the second one was to examine temporal access to forest resources among socially differentiated groups and its effects on vulnerability. Uh, briefly, I'll highlight the theoretical framework to give a connection between the data collected and the results. So basically, PFM is premised and widely supported on the basis of three main objectives. The first one is improving rural livelihoods. The second one, enhancing forest conservation. And the third one, contributing to better resource governance. So these three goals are critical pillars for reducing rural vulnerability. And uh, grammatically, um, you can see endowments uh, constitute uh, initial resources, such as land and forest which are then utilized by socially differentiated actors to uh, provide different claims, such as food, firewood, water, grazing, and ecotourism, which again produce socially differentiated actors, which produce either people's vulnerability, reduce or increase people's vulnerability. And so PFM as an intervention comes in where resources such as forests are being used and uh, trans. Tr trans and, and then producing either vulnerability, reducing or increasing vulnerability of socially differentiated actors. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge other in institutions, such as historical evolution of other laws, such as land uh, and tenure laws. Um, and to my case study, I concentrated on a Garendare forest, which is actually located on north central Kenya, here on this map. And the forest is about 5,000 hectares, surrounded by big uh, ranches, which started as cattle ranches but have now moved to wildlife conservation and ecotourism, such as Borana, Lewa. And down here is a large-scale farm called Kisima Farm, which is mainly wheat growing and other large-scale farming. But around the forest, you can see six villages of inten intensive settlements, uh, where you have the small-scale holders uh, residing and cult cultivating an average of about 1.2 hectares, but utilizing the forest. So the interdependence of these uh, large-scale farms and conservancies and the small holders around here on the forest is what I'll be concentrating on. The characteristics of the site, the site was basically selected because of its clear dependence of forest by socially differentiated actors. That is extremely wealthy and landed colonial settlers, as well as poor smallholder farmers. Uh, the forest is located on an interface uh, of humid slopes of Mount Kenya and uh, Samburu ecosystems towards the north. PFM as an intervention started in, 2000s, in the year 2000, making a shift from state control of forest to involvement of local communities. Uh, so the kind of ecosystem services the forest provides, first I'll start with the large-scale farmers and the conservancies. First is the high-end ecotourism. So this is one of the lodges, Borana Lodge in, in Borana Farm. And, uh, and then you can see it's such high-end tourism. Uh, it was a site for uh, the engagement of uh, Prince William and, Kate and, and Princess Kate. Uh, the other ecotourism ecosystem service for the uh, large-scale farmers is water for irrigation. As I mentioned, you have wheat farming in Kisima Farm, and you have a lot of greenhouses around Tima, which also depend on the water coming from the, from the forest. And the other one is uh, wildlife conservation, which is very much related to the wildlife conservancies and ecotourism. And for the small-scale farmers, you have firewood collection, and grazing in the forest, because the farms are too small, as I indicated, about 1.2 hectares on average, it's not enough for grazing the livestock within the farms, so they use the forest for grazing, as well as intensive irrigation of the small fields. 
And uh, sometimes since the beginning of PFM, there has been ecotourism activities with the revenue collected by the communities for community development. So what has been the outcomes? Uh, so I'll start with the community level dynamics in which I investigated what kind of benefits have, have resulted at the community level since PFM. And basically, uh, the interviews and the surveys and interview data indicated really there was no much change at the household level because the dependence on the forest for livestock uh, grazing and for water provision and for firewood collection at the household level uh, remained the same. But what was actually uh, a change is that after the community, after PFM, uh, that's participatory forest management, the community started collecting revenues from 2010, which is the, the, the bars with the lines. And this revenue is collected uh, by t from tourists who come to visit the forest and invested into community development. But on the intra-household or intra-community intra dynamics, this is where I was looking at the entitlements, the different claims by the different groups on the forest uh, services. And so on this, on this side of the table, you see large-scale farmers interested in conservation and ecotourism, and therefore they are concerned about overgrazing by small-scale farmers. And hence, they have uh, supported levying grazing fees for the small-scale farmers so that they con can control the grazing into the forest. And secondly, uh, the large volumes of water required for irrigation, especially the big farms like Kisima and other greenhouses around, green, green gas ha uh, greenhouses around, um, you find also that the, the water required there is a lot. And for the small-scale farmers, the main interest of environmental claims, which is entitlements, is grazing because their farms are far too small. They want to graze in the forest and they also do firewood collection. And also, as I mentioned, grazing is charged per head of cattle or sheep or goat. And uh, firewood collection also with a charge of about 300 shillings per head load uh, per month. And also, because the farms are too small, they also require intensive irrigation. And so there's that kind of competition between claims of the different actors, with, uh, with, with mainly the large-scale farmers prevailing and controlling the local institution, which is the Community Forest Association, in order to be able to control what the small-scale farmers are able to get. And so on to my discussions and conclusions, uh, the forest provided different kind of benefits to socially differentiated segments of the society. And the second uh, discussion is that PFM introduced minor benefits at the community level through ecotourism, but household benefits did not change, again, as shown in the results. And a competition of environmental entitlements by socially differentiated groups challenged the realization of benefits, particularly for the less endowed segments of the society. Um, and so the conclusions, including policy interventions such as PFM, should therefore recognize the differential endowments and entitlement uh, claims in order to overcome iniquity and biased access to forest uh, benefits. And also in order to reduce vulnerability, policy interventions like PFM must be accompanied by addressing of structural causes of inequality, such as the very skewed distribution of tenure, which you've seen in this case, uh, some uh, households having as much as 10,000 hectares and others uh, having only 1.2 hectares. So thank you very much. Um.